right? So you can maintain these kinds of allele frequencies. The nice thing about a DNA marker like that is that you don't have to worry about epistasis or interactions with the environment. Why that? Why don't I have to worry about epistasis or environmental interactions if I'm looking at a difference between a G and a C in a DNA sequence? Yeah, it's just a sequence, right? So it doesn't interact in any way with the other allele or with another gene to change its sequence. It is that nucleotide, okay? An environment doesn't change it other than the very, very rare case that it could mutate again or something like that, right? The, you can read that DNA. It's not dependent on the environment of the cell. Okay, or the organism. Okay. For practical reasons, what we actually use are um, polymorphisms that are usually not single digitized. We can. And as DNA sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper, we in fact could get to the day where when we do a test like this, we just sequence your entire genome. Okay, but at this point that's too expensive. So if you wanted to do a paternity test where you sequence mom, dad, and a child, that would be about thirty thousand dollars worth of sequencing, and then probably another ten, twenty thousand dollars to pay to actually have it assembled and analyzed. Okay. But you can do it much, much easier than that. And one of the ways we do this is with simple repetitive sequences, okay? And they're called microsatellites, so simple sequence repeats. And their individual repeat units are two to six nucleotides long, and they're repeated three to hundred times, something like that. They're very variable. And so this is an example. So the unit is CAA, and in this allele, it's repeated five times. And in this allele is repeated seven times, okay, the same sequence. Okay. So how can you take advantage of that? And this would be a polymorphism in the sequence, right? It's embedded in a, you know, a sequence that's very unique, right? So what's done is to, is to go ahead and use PCR. So nowadays, so you can amplify so that the flanking region is not repetitive, okay, and it's unique in the genome, okay? So you're not gonna find the sequence anywhere else in your DNA. And that, once you get to about 21 to 25 nucleotides, the probability is that that's actually specific, okay? And then you get added specificity because you need both primers to actually work, okay, be, be uh, facing in the right direction. So you can add these primers to a DNA sample and then amplify it. And what's going to, what you should see is that you're gonna get different lengths depending on the number of repeats that's in here, right? The primers are the same position out here, but the length difference is caused by the different numbers of repeats. And in this case, it's eight versus seven versus nine, and the repeats are CTT on the strand, okay? Does everyone follow that, okay? These usually aren't too long, okay? How do they occur? There's actually a couple ways that they can occur and change number, but the, the one that most people think about is, is this one, which is that, again, polymerase is usually extremely accurate, but every now and then it, it, something will go wrong. And one of the things that goes wrong is something called slippage. So when it, polymerase hits um, something that it's, that it's actually trying to replicate, that it's already a short repeat, okay? Sometimes what you'll do is you'll slip on that strand and you'll end up making a new strand that contains even more copies of that repeat, okay? So that's a mistake. Okay, so then what happens, we talked about before, is that when there's a region like this that, you know, is single-stranded and not double-stranded like it's supposed to be, um, there are repair enzymes that come along and try to fix the mistake, okay? So if it cut this off and repaired it, then it would be right back to what it was in the template. But instead, if it repairs it so that it uses this as a template and repairs it, now it's going to add a bunch more repeats, okay? And that's the way that, you, that this becomes polymorphic in the population, is because over time, there'll be rare events like this that cause those repeats to either expand, and, and it, next week we'll talk about a mechanism that can shorten them again, too. But you'll get variation in the number of those repeats, okay? And when you have sequences that don't have those kinds of repeat structures, DNA polymerase doesn't make that kind of mistake, and you normally don't get slippage. So what we do is we do that PCR and then we run it on a gel. And I think you guys have run probably most of you at some point or another have seen a DNA agarose gel. You run on a slightly special gel because these are really small DNA fragments, okay? But then you can resolve them. And so this would be a typical pattern, okay? So you can think of these as different individuals, okay? This is really actually in plants, but these could be people just as well, all right? And then you've done the amplification. Okay, and these are the nucleotide sizes. So they go from 180, I mean the marker goes from 180 to 190. Okay. So you've got a couple sizes. So the first question I can ask you is how many different alleles do you see in this, right? The sum of all these. Okay, so remember what happens when there's different numbers of repeats for the product. Okay, and how many different alleles? One, two, five, four. Okay, that's right. So there's one allele, two, three, and four. Okay, and you can see the gel's not quite straight, but there are four different alleles. Okay, and so there are four alleles and their sizes are given here. Okay. Um, and you can see that they're, they go in three base pair increments, so it's some sort of triplet repeat, and they're in three base pair increments. And so you're resolving these uh, as these four different alleles, okay? Um, and then, which in, so of these numbered individuals up here, uh, which one is uh, homozygous for the 184 base pair allele? Anybody? Number seven? Okay, that's right. Do you understand that? So there's, number seven is homozygous for something because there's only a single band, and that's the 184, 81, 84, 87, 90, okay? So it would be number seven. And then which individual is heterozygous for both 181 and 190? Five? Okay? All right. So what you're, you're doing is then reading genotypes, okay? Because you're able to see these different alleles this way molecularly, okay? And so then this is just the, the listing of the different uh, sizes there, okay? And you use that like you would genotypes, okay? Okay, so what would happen if I cross individual number five with number three? What would I get? Okay, so think about it for a minute and I'll show you the answer and you can see if you've been thinking about it right, okay? And it's really nothing more than Mendelian genetics, okay? So what you do is you just write out a Punnett square again, okay? And so now I've called this marker one and then the allele is the size. And so if I do that, then I get this pattern, okay? That if I, if I had a cross between individual five and three, so if I had you know, offspring, then what I have is half of the progeny would be heterozygous for 187 and 181, and the other half would be heterozygous for 187 and 190. Okay, does that make sense? So one of the nice things about this is that I can read the genotype of both alleles, right, with this kind of assay. I mean, I can see that I can understand both alleles when I do this assay. All right, so, okay, so now let's use this to decide who's the father, okay? So here's a really, really simple example, okay? So this is the information I have. It's some other set of, you know, don't, it doesn't have to be exactly what I showed you on that gel, but you should be able to understand it, okay? So is Tom the father of this child? Okay, no, right? Tom's off the hook? Yeah, okay, good point, right? So assume no, no, no new mutations, and that's a good point. So what if there'd suddenly been a mutation, right? And that allele in Tom's sperm had shortened back to 184, right? And so he was really the father. Okay, so how do we get around that, okay? Yeah, check a bunch of loci, okay? So not just one, all right? So many, because it's unlikely that they would all mutate you know, at once, all right? So, uh, but the good thing about DNA testing, this is the point I'll try to make, is it's very easy to exclude someone, okay? So it's very easy to say you're not the father, okay? It's not so easy to say for sure that you are, and that's what we'll try to explain, okay? So what about now, is Bill the father? Okay, now we'll assume that there's no mutations. Okay, who votes that Maury is going to say Bill's the father? Okay, a couple people, right? Bill's in trouble, okay? Uh, but maybe, but it's really, really iffy. And why is it iffy? 
What's that? Yeah, you could, but, but why is that? Why can't you say for sure that Bill's the father? Okay, but that's, that doesn't have anything to do with Bill. What's that? Yeah, okay. So this is the problem, right? Is that, well, Bill's not the only person in the world with this allele, okay? And so why can't it be somebody else other than Bill, okay? And that, that becomes the thing that you're going to try to figure out. So now assume that that allele is in 90% of all men. This is not a very good marker for you to use. It hardly made any difference, right, to thinking about it because it's so frequent in the population, okay? So you can calculate then what the probability would be there would be someone else if you knew the frequency in the population. But now assume that that allele was one in a million, okay? So now Bill's looking a little more guilty, okay? All right, but assume that Bill has a brother named Eric, okay? And that Bill's dad was 184, 184, okay? So it could be Eric, right? Okay? And this happens on the Mori Povich show all the time, right? I, I don't know. Okay. All right, so now we try to have more alleles, right? Okay, so what's going to happen now? Now tell me whether Bill is the father or not. Okay, so now it's looking a little bit more likely, right? So we've got three loci that all seem to say, yeah, okay, this is possible. But what I need to do is calculate a probability, right? So, and I can do that. I'm not going to try to go through all the math of how you calculate probability. It's actually become very complicated. But what it depends on is the frequency of each allele in the population, right? So you can kind of understand that. You can even, in this very simple way, if you just think of the alleles, all of them being like in 50% of the population, you can come up with like kind of a very simple way of thinking about as I add each allele, how much that's going to increase my confidence, all right? And then other factors can come into play. And a large one, unfortunately, is human error, okay? So the technician doing the test doesn't have the right primers. The gel runs kind of funny, and the bands are not actually uh, counted properly. Uh, another thing that can happen is if you don't realize that there's linkage between markers. So what you think are independent results are not, okay? So think about that. If the alleles are actually closely linked, you can run into a problem. So if two of them are always, almost always together, then you can't count them as two independent events, okay? And so you have to be careful about that. Um, and then there's another problem that you have to take ethnicity into account. It's a little bit tricky, okay? And it's because that allele frequencies are not identical amongst different ethnic groups. So there's no allele that's indicative of any one ethnicity. That, that I don't think there's any case of that. But what you do have is that you have frequencies that are slightly different. So when you're doing your calculations, you have to be careful. And there was an infamous story that when the FBI first started doing, doing DNA testing, right? But they wouldn't release what the alleles were that they were actually using to make their determination. And it turned out that they collected all their data from FBI agents, okay? And there was a predominance of Europeans, right? White, white males. And so they had very good allele frequency for that population. But it turns out for other ethnicities, right? Things that were common in those other groups that were rare in that group, then the, the probability looked very high, but in fact it wasn't at all. And so that's something else that has to be taken into account. Um, yeah. No, no, I mean, so, so it's gotten to a point. We'll get to what the accuracy is nowadays in just a second. But that's a good point, you know, because as you get more and more data, you can make this better and better, right? And as it becomes easier and easier to do the genotyping and cheaper and cheaper, you can get to a point where the accuracy is extremely high, okay? But anyway, so, um, but I would recommend that, you know, if you're doing it, don't go to a place like this, okay? I didn't know these existed until a fellow student of yours told me about these. Uh, I think I wouldn't trust this as a way to do it, all right? Um, but you can calculate, like I said, you can calculate the percentages. And, and one of the problems we have is the law doesn't keep up with the technology. So these are the threshold percentages that are law in different states to be considered a father, okay? And I don't know about you, but I find it very disturbing that there could be a five, you know, you could be wrong 5% of the time. I mean, the, sorry, that would be the probability. It would be only a 95% confidence, and yet legally would be considered a father. And there have been many cases now of men being declared the father, and in fact they're not, but they had passed that 95% legal limit with a match of alleles, okay? So it'd be a good thing to be in Louisiana, actually, okay? California actually is the most strict that I could find, but it's, it's a very confusing way of uh, describing it, so I didn't try to give it a number here. Okay, so now I'm going to show you one more thing, okay? So, is Jamie the father? Okay, what's wrong with this one? The mom's not the mom, right? Okay, so if, if neither of the parents seem to be the parents, right? Okay, so that could be an adopted child. It could be switched at birth, right? Okay, but this is a very strange case. How is the mother not the mother? Okay, nowadays there could be complicated reasons. It could be in vitro fertilization, it could be a donor egg, right, in vitro fertilization, which is not biologically the mother, okay? But this is a real case, and there's a woman almost thrown in jail because of this. And so her name is Lydia Fairchild, and her boyfriend is this guy, Jamie Townsend, and they have four kids, okay? And the state, she, was, she lived in the state of Washington, she was on welfare, and for some reason the state actually did DNA testing, and they told her that none of her children were hers, okay? That this father was the father of all of them, but she was not the mother of any of them. She was closely related to whoever was the real mother. Okay? And at that time, she only had three kids, but was pregnant with the fourth, right? They're about to throw her in jail. She has, she gives birth to the fourth child. And the court has that child genotyped as soon as it's born, and it also is not her child, okay? And they figure she doesn't have the money for in vitro fertilization. There's no way, okay? So you want to give me an explanation? Okay? And this is a really good example of how, yes, in a way, DNA testing is infallible, okay? But there are so many complicated things that go on in biology, you can't fall into the trap that it's infallible, okay? Does anyone know this story? There's actually a very cool television program about it. Yeah? Sure, no, go ahead. Right, but why? She doesn't have two sets of chromosomes in any one cell. Right, right. It's ended, up, it's ended up in many TV shows now, right? And, and the reason that it was figured out was because of this woman. So, so, so Lydia was actually not very well off. There was a public defender trying to defend, defend her against this charge. Um, but there was a woman who was from a well-to-do family in Boston, Karen Keegan, and she needed a kidney transplant. She had two sons, and the two sons were genotyped to see if they, were good, they would be good donors. And when the results came back, they said, well, one of your sons is not your son. The father's the father. You are not the mother. And she says, I remember having a kid. Okay? Um, and so it turns out that both Karen and Lydia are what are called human chimeras. Okay? And, that name, and there's, a, there's a, a really good documentary called The Twin Inside of Me. So you all know what paternal twins are, right? When there's two eggs that are fertilized, right? But these are genetically distinct, right? They, the same mother, the same father, but they're two different eggs, two different products of meiosis, two different sperm. And so they don't necessarily look like each other, right? And sometimes they can be you know, quite different looking from each other. They're paternal twins, they're born at the same time, right? They're normally in the womb at the same time. Every now and then, unfortunate things happen, and the embryos fuse together, okay? If it happens very late, it's one way of getting a Siamese twin, not the only way, okay? Other times it can be kind of very, very weird. You'll have, like, in the tiny you'll have, like, a piece of something strange in you that's like teeth, okay? And it's what's left of your twin that you basically swallowed it during development, okay? Not through your mouth, but you fused with it. 
So imagine now that what happens is you fuse with a twin very, very early when it's only a few cells. And now you're a chimera. You're one embryo, okay? But you're composed of two different original embryos. So that means you have two different genotypes, okay? And on rare occasions, in fact, in Lydia's case, it was extremely unusual. It was only her germline, only the cells making her egg that were left from her twin. The rest of her was a different genotype. In Karen's case, she was actually very chimeric. So in fact, when they took blood from her, they could actually see both genotypes in her blood. But in Lydia's case, it was actually just her ovary. So I'll leave that as, as an example of how good DNA is, right? Figuring these things out, but how careful you have to be. What's that? 